Uh, our speaker is Director of Compliance at GeoVera Holdings, where she oversees regulatory compliance for the organization. She has extensive experience in both personal as well as commercial lines. She provides counsel on a full range of legal issues with particular emphasis on insurance law as well as regulatory matters. She monitors multi-jurisdictional changes in legislation and evaluates the legal implication of the changes on both current and future business practices. Her first career in insurance was for many years as an underwriter for both personal and commercial carriers. So please join me in welcoming Diane Bauer. Well, good morning, almost afternoon. I think I'm the one bringing up the rear here just before lunch, so I appreciate you uh, hanging in. And uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about a few things, the sharing economy, which I think should resonate with all of us at this point now that it's settled in a little bit, as well as some of the new laws that are going to be coming into effect, uh, most of them January 1st, that will impact you and your clients, potentially the insurance companies that you're appointed with as well as uh, autonomous vehicles, which we have all uh, heard all kinds of things about. And I'll try to split my time accordingly. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask. Um, I want to try to squeeze everything in. I didn't do a deep dive necessarily on any of these topics. I wanted to try to hit as many high-level developments as there have been in the uh, last few months. Because interestingly enough, I spoke back in April to some of you folks up in Sacramento. And a lot of times when you come out and you speak, at these various conferences, you can kind of take your uh, talking points from the last time and maybe tweak them a little bit. I can tell you safely that after speaking in April, that's not an option because there has just been so many developments on all of these uh, fronts. So unfortunately or fortunately, this is um, an ever-changing landscape, if you will. So just out of curiosity, how many people flew into Palm Springs? Wow. How many, right, how many flew into Ontario? Okay. So I won't ask this question because from Ontario to here would be one heck of an Uber ride, but how many of you have used Uber in the last, say, 30 days? Wow. Any of you home sharing on the home sharing platforms or have any of you used the home sharing platforms? Okay, okay. Pretty representative of what we're seeing out there. So about three to four years ago, this term, sharing economy, was largely unfamiliar to us, frightened most of us in the industry, at least those of us that have been in the industry for some period of time. And it was difficult to even get your head around how it all worked. Our bookmarks, of course, for the sharing economy were, are the Ubers and the Airbnbs. And I'll use those terms, but I'm not necessarily limiting my discussion to those particular companies. It's just easier than saying home sharing platform or transportation network company. Uh, I'll also call them TNCs just to, uh, for the sake of discussion. But there's numerous Ubers out there. there are, they have plenty of competition. The Airbnbs are starting to get more competition as well on the home sharing. And for the first time last year, the term sharing economy actually appeared in the Oxford English Dictionary. And I can tell you that that definition I've purposely left out. It's gotten some criticism because the word sharing is in it. And we'll talk about why that may, might not be such a great indicator of what the sharing economy is. There is no solid definition, at least amongst those of us in the industry. But what it is essentially is it's an environment where you have an unused or an idle asset and or idle labor. And you have someone who wants to make use of it. And what the platform is, the, the business, is in the in the business of facilitating connecting those two. It's really consumers doing business with consumers. So we call it anything from the gig economy, gig implying that it's really a transactional type economy or a transactional type business, one and done. Uh, you use it and then you move on with your life. Uh, sharing economy, collaborative consumption is another term that you see being used in connection with uh, this type of environment. Uh, in, on the labor side, you think of your freelance folks, people that work kind of on demand. And if you think about TNC drivers, your Uber drivers, it's a combination of the two, right? You have this unused idle asset because we have cars that we drive about 5 to 10 percent of their lives. The rest of the time they're sitting in a driveway or our work parking lot not being used. 
and then you have, this un, uh, you have this unused or idle labor, a person who's ready to drive, so they're a kind of a hybrid, and they come together, and voila, you have a TNC driver. So there's even, and I know that most of you by now have heard about this, not just Airbnb, but Airbnb, where people are sharing their bathrooms in their homes via an application. It sounds a little bit ridiculous, but if you start thinking about where this started, it was on the Mardi Gras parade route, where you can get stuck, and you need a bathroom, and you don't necessarily want to patronize a business that might be on the route, maybe there's a home. The Boston Marathon route, things like that, where people need that, and people say, well, I've got this unused bathroom, I'll stick it on this application, and people can come in and use it. We'll talk about the insurance implications in a minute. Largely, the uh, platform, if you will, is a pass-through. The reason I left, by the way, the reason I left the um, Oxford Dictionary um, definition out was because it did use the word sharing. There's nothing getting shared here, <laughs> so which is why it's such a misnomer. It's really almost a more of a market bazaar base capitalism taking place here. And it's really just putting two people together. No more do you have to wander through the bazaar looking at 4,000 things you're not interested in until you find the one thing you are. Now you have somebody facilitating the one thing that you need. And nobody's sharing anything. They're doing it for money. So the business, basically, like I said, they do a pass-through. And they keep a little bit of the proceeds for themselves, a cut of the profits, if you will. So it is simple, right? But it's not. We all know that now that we're in the business of insuring these risks, depending on, you know, you might be on the driver's side, you might be on the company side. Who's participating in the economy? Who is the audience? Well, we just raised our hands. A lot of us have used Uber. Some of us have used Airbnb. Some of us are actually sharing our home on Airbnb. It's not just those types of companies, though, that are in our current vernacular today. How many people have used eBay in the past or used Etsy, Pinterest, uh, any of those types, uh, StubHub? I got second row tickets to Jimmy Buffett because I used StubHub, not because I went to that other ticket site. So that's also, if you think about it, facilitating consumers doing business with consumers with this middleman that kind of keeps their cut of the proceeds. And essentially you have 50% 50, 50 of US, sorry, 50 of adults in the US have purchased goods secondhand online. I'm not so not necessarily used, you know, garage sale type goods, but just secondhand. You're not the original purchaser. And only 15% of us in the United States have utilized rideshare applications. So those numbers kind of are indicative of the level to which we're comfortable. And I don't think you will see much fluctuation in those numbers. What I mean by that is for those of us that have wanted to go on to sites like StubHub and buy tickets, or um, you know, eBay and, and, and bid on goods and the numbers of folks that are willing to go and use Uber. I think the ones that want to have and the ones that don't probably won't unless it becomes the sole source of transportation. So it'll be interesting to see how the uh, numbers change, if at all. And so you have this, uh, these whole host of companies. They are here and they've arrived. I will tell you, three, four years ago, I sat at conferences and many of us laughed at the Uber concept. We didn't think they'd stick around. We thought it was going to be short-lived. We all kind of scoffed and said, oh, that's commercial lines. You know, that's never going to be entertained in the personal lines world. Boy, howdy, it has. And they're here. They're here to stay. And you see our own industry, for once, I think, not always being in a reactionary place, to some degree being in a proactive place. And that's what I meant when I said, for once, the insurance industry is out in front. Because a lot of us who have been in the business for a long time know that primarily carriers tend to do things in a more of a reactionary way. So it is exciting. So I don't want to necessarily be Debbie Downer on what the insurance implications are, because there are a lot, and there's a lot to think about. And for your, your folks, you have to be so incredibly educated as to what all of the different caveats and aspects are to this uh, economy and the exposures that come with it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And there are numerous areas. I'm going to talk primarily about the, sorry, about, you got Bauer and Quadrophenia here. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the insurance implications and then the subsequent legal, the associated legal uh, aspects of those insurance implications. So bar none, the biggest 
presented types of companies is the TNCs, the transportation network companies. And we've all kind of had a TNC hangover, if you will. Last year, I think we were just over it. We were done listening to Uber. We were done hearing about periods one, two, and three. Does everybody remember those periods? Are you pretty familiar with those? Real quick review. For those that are operating in the TNC world, if you're a driver, period one is when you have the app turned on, you're logged on, and you have not been matched with a rider yet. Period two is when you've finally been matched with a rider and they're on their way to pick them up. And then period three is when the rider is in the car. Those are your three ch chunks of exposure, if you will, to be considered. And so um, I will tell you that on the California Department of Insurance website, you will find a table that shows a list of the companies that decided to start offering coverage for those periods. Some companies only dipped their toe in the pool, willing to potentially go in and offer period one coverage. Some offer one, two, and three. I will also tell you that table has not really changed in the last four to six months. So like the users of Uber that come in and they've decided they're going to use it, those of us that haven't, don't. The companies that want to get in on that action and, and, and cover that exposure, they've filed, it's been approved, and they're out there writing it. The rest of the companies are in a wait and see mode. I don't think you're suddenly going to see another flood of, of carriers coming in and offering up uh, endorsements for filing and approval. On the uh, underwriting side, companies are deciding still how they're going to deal with that. They're asking the question on the application. Interestingly enough, I was with my son a couple of weeks ago. He bought a car and the dealership asked him, before he could even drive the car off the lot, the dealership asked him if he was going to use the car to, as a TNC driver. So um, everybody's making sure, trying to be on the front end to see how this is going to take place. Again, I wouldn't expect to see a huge volume of filings from here on out. You know your carriers that are considering, uh, that offer products to cover for your clients that are doing this. And uh, you do see a little bit of a wide variance in the rates. I think those will tend to even out as time goes on. Um, some based on mileage, you'll see the percentage that they charge on the premium surcharge, certain for liability, more for physical damage. Uh, I think you'll see those even out eventually for, for the sake of competition. As far as the laws that apply here in California, a couple of years ago, we did pass Assembly Bill 2293, which was known as our rideshare bill, and it set forth minimum requirements for that TNC activity. Just a quick overview. For that period one, the driver does need to carry limits of minimum limits of 50, 130. Uh, the TNC has to carry 200,000 excess, and then while the person is in the car, it's a million dollar primary liability carried by the TNC. We thought in California, we were so trendsetty, we thought that a lot of the states in the nation would kind of copy that particular law and make it their own. They did to some degree, but NAIC did put out a model law for transportation network companies, and that was adopted largely in the large number of states that have now passed TNC legislation. Uh, it's roughly similar. It's 5,125 during period one that most of these states now require, and it's still the million dollar primary liability. Some states vary on whether UM, UIM has to be uh, carried. Some states, most states are quiet on physical damage. So there is some variance, but for the most part, states have uh, adopted the NAIC model law with very few amendments. What I have seen in the last year for states that didn't do it in the year prior when TNC legislation was really booming is that they're now uh, including a section in the law that identifies specific criteria so that if you're a TNC driver, you're considered an independent contractor if, and then they set forth uh, roughly about eight to ten criteria that are met. And, the reason that's important will come up in a minute, but you know, are your TNC drivers employees or are they independent contractors? And that debate rages on, as you all know. So some of the other um, questions for insurers, you know, how do you rate? Is, is it appropriate to use mileage? That seems to be a good indicator. We all know that Prop 103 sets certain, cert, sets certain rating confines on insurers, and so our um, Insurers are grappling with, you know, wanting to be innovative and provide coverage for this type of exposure, but at the same time, uh, 
what do we charge and, and how do we make it work within the Prop 103? We have good drivers. What if the California good driver requires us to offer these policies, but yet they're doing TNC activity? And what if we want to underwrite and maybe limit our eligibility? Well, what if they make good driver? And it just turns into this kind of circular Tasmanian devil. And, and carriers are still grappling with this, even though it's gone largely quiet in, because there's other things going on in the industry. But do know that um, they are still thinking about it. There's other questions about uh, when are you actually logged out? Some drivers are very uh, good about turning off the app when they're done. Other drivers stay logged on, so that period one gets a little bit murky. And there's some platforms that automatically log you out after a period of inactivity. So the question is, who are you driving for? What if you have multiple apps open and you're driving for multiple uh, TNC companies? There's also the issue of distracted driving. We all know that the uh, drivers will log on to multiple apps so that they can be available for a variety of uh, TNC companies, but they're also logging on now as users. So they're acting as if they're someone who's looking for a ride, and they do that so that they can position themselves in the most competitive place, and they'll go where the least drivers are and maybe the most riders are so that they will be the one to, to actually get the ride. So it's still um, a little bit up in the air for carriers, and I think what remains unsettled largely, again, is whether or not these drivers are employees or independent contractors. And I think the question is, are they something in between, some kind of hybrid that you'll start to see perhaps your legislative schema will change and there will have to be some new rules around this new type of on-demand uh, driver. Work, I'm gonna call them a worker because they're not an employee and maybe they're not quite an independent contractor. Um, you know, the TNC still have a great deal of control over the branding over the pricing. When you go onto the Uber website, that's all the company. Uh, and the price for the ride is dictated by the company. So when you start to look at how much influence the TNCs have over the drivers, it starts to not really look so much like an independent contractor situation. But of course, the drivers are largely, you know, on their own schedule. They drive as much as they want. They drive as little as they want. Uh, there are some rules around how much they're supposed to drive. And you still have other issues, such as tax issues, wage and hour issues. Um, there are a couple of high profile class action lawsuits still going on in California, with one with Uber. Again, this whole debate as to whether or not they're independent contractors or not. Interestingly enough, Uber offered $100 million to settle their lawsuit. That offer was rejected. That litigation is ongoing. On the flip side, Lyft offered, a, I think, a $27.5 million settlement offer in theirs, and it's been preliminarily accepted. It's in the fi final approval stages. Neither case is willing to come down and make a statement as to whether these drivers are one or the other. So stay tuned. Uh, I think you will, again, start to see some kind of hybrid worker classification come out of this, not anytime soon. And then maybe there will be certain aspects of a workers' compensation type benefit that would be given to these folks, but yet other things that don't really make sense because they do have so much control over their own schedule and how much they participate in the company and the fact that they can participate with multiple companies. So I think you'll start to see some type of um, hybrid there. So it's not just on the personal line side. Obviously, the commercial auto side sees this as well. You have your fleets. If they still have fleets, we'll talk about autonomous vehicles in a minute. Um, but if, you're, if your um, commercial clients have fleets, largely sometimes they've dispensed with these if they do goods delivery and they're utilizing Uber to do it on a transactional basis. What do you do there? Uh, because the liability is generally the GL potentially could still be in play. There is no livery exclusion like there is on the auto side. And that, speaking of the livery exclusion, just quickly on the personal auto side, You'll see companies doing one of two things, or both. They're either tightening up that livery exclusion, because right now it, it's not necessarily specific to TNC activity, so you may see your carriers if you haven't already. They've got new exclusions that are specific to TNC activity. And or you'll see them offering up these uh, period one, period two endorsements that I talked about that some of the carriers are out there. And companies largely are doing both. 
just, in, just to cover all of their bases. So on the commercial auto side, it starts to get more of a how is your risk classified? And what if you have a painting contractor that's, you, do you even know that they're doing this? And I think that's a um, concern is, is how do you get aware about what your clients are doing? You, you see them at application time potentially, maybe on the personal line side, it's done largely online, or you, you, know, you may talk to them every six months. So maybe they weren't thinking of doing this activity when you first wrote the policy, but they've decided to do it a week into the policy, and largely a lot of us don't even know until the day after the loss that this was happening. <clears throat> so um, I've got an agent broker takeaway. I'm going to leave those till the end after home sharing because they're essentially uh, very similar. So stay tuned for that. Just so that you know, Uber now has a fleet of vehicles that you can use if you don't own a car, but you still want to drive for them. Think about how that's all going to work out. I don't know. Um, they can lease. I think GMAC entered into a lease agreement where you can lease a vehicle. They start to pay for some of the maintenance costs and things associated with the, driving, with the operation of the vehicle. Wow, this is starting to smell a little bit more like an employee situation now. So there's a lot of changes on, the, on that front. When we get to autonomous vehicles, this is so yesterday with Uber. They, they've moved on. They now don't even have drivers in their cars anymore. So we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> so home sharing. Again, a few of you raised your hand as using it. Worldwide, the Airbnb market is, is quite active, and I think you'll start to see it more so here. Uh, the companies, I'll say Airbnb, I don't mean just Airbnb, VRBO, Expedia's purchased, I think, HomeAway, or HomeAway's, you know, purchased VRBO. Somebody owns somebody in there. Initially, when we talked about home sharing, nobody really worried about this. It just wasn't on anybody's radar. Uh, in the last couple of years, though, uh, more companies have started, and you've got uh, investors that are starting to purchase multi-hab properties in the interest of providing these short-term rental situations. Uh, there's a public policy issue associated now because these investors are coming in and snapping up these properties in some of your ideal coastal destinations. And so the local residents are finding an availability issue with just trying to get um, housing. So what you really have on the home sharing side is two audiences, if you will. You've got your owner occupants that just want minimal restrictions on the freedom to rent. Whether they're renting something just like a room or their whole house or, you know, or a vacation rental if it's in another destination. And then on the other side, you've got your municipalities, governments, as well as the hospitality industry going, wait a second, this needs to be regulated. Maybe this needs to be taxed. The hospitality industry, much like the taxi lobby on the TNC side, says, wait a second, we have to operate under all these regulations and you know, tax requirements, and this guy's over here essentially engaging in the same type of business, and they're not regulated in the same way. So think about the hospitality industry, much like the taxi lobby. And there's kind of your two audiences when you're talking about home sharing. What we end up seeing in home sharing with legislation is that you get the local ordinances start to be ch changed by city councils, and they set rules about how long you can rent your home or how many stays you can have per year. But then back at the state level, the legislature might be working on a, a bill, a Senate bill or something, which is setting a whole different set of rules. And a lot of times those, those two rules aren't always aligned very well. And yes, state law does trump local ordinance, but at the same time, if it gets a little bit messy. And that happened with TNCs too, right? A lot of cities started to say, you know, you can't drive it, you can't use Uber, you can't have Uber at the airports, and you know, they have to carry this certain insurance, and then you had another city with a different set of rules. Well, and then all of a sudden the state passes a law that says, here's the rules. So that's happening on the home sharing front as well. And quite frankly, it can be just a mess. So the challenges are similar uh, to some degree. Some are different. Insurer awareness, agent awareness, uh, broker awareness is still a big issue. So even if your applications are asking about it, are they doing it on the day they're applying for the policy? Maybe, maybe not. More often, again, you find out about this exposure after the loss. The insured awareness also is an issue, just like the TNC driver. They don't always know whether they're covered and if they are, how, and if they're not, where are the gaps and, and is there any way to, to meet those gaps? Um, on the home side, most insureds have really no 
clear clue as to whether or not their homeowner's policy or their renter's policy covers it, excludes it, to, and to what extent. Are they even familiar with their local ordinances if there are these ordinances that are in play? Interestingly enough, I think this kind of came up when Rob spoke earlier, but if there's an ordinance and you're breaking it and there's a claim, is that a legal activity? Most claims are in the denial place if there's a legal activity. So, you know, would that happen? I don't know, but it's just something to think about. So what do you need to do uh, as far as, you, letting your clients know about the local ordinances that are in place, if there are any, the state laws, if there are any. It's a constant state of education, and it's always changing. So you need to look at the policy. Are there exclusions? Are they for business? Keep in mind, when they wrote the exclusions that are there, the drafters at the time were more concerned about someone running a hair salon out of the first floor of their home a lawyer running his practice out of the left half of the home. That's really what the exclusions were there for. They didn't entertain anything like what we're doing now. There is even some coverage in the homeowner's contract, depending on whose contract you're looking at, where the occasional border is okay. So, but it's a moving target. It's not very clearly defined, which again, ISO, for example, is coming out, or has come out, I think, I believe they're out, with endorsements to either tighten up the exclusions and or offer coverage uh, for the, the variety of ways this can happen, whether it's a nightly, weekly, vacation home uh, type exposure. Uh, even the business personal property, is it my couch, is it my bed? Well, it is when I live there, but what if I rent that bedroom out? Has it now become business personal property? As you know, in the homeowner's contract, that exclusion changes depending on what coverage part you're talking about. So it could be a very strong exclusion for liability, for example, but you may have less of a clear exclusion under, per, under property. So you, um, we'll talk about the takeaways in just a second, but knowing that underlying contract is critical. So as far as what the different platforms offer, as far as coverages and programs, uh, Airbnb does offer primary liability for the, uh, the guest and, sorry, for the host, for the guests that are staying there. They have a program for when there is property damage caused by the guest. And I call it a program because it's not a policy. So you, there are some rules around it. So you have this guest who comes and stays in your home and he trashes the room and then he leaves. And you're going, great, what do I do? So the hosting platform will say, try to recover from the guest. Yeah, I don't think we know how that would go. Probably, they're long gone. So you're probably not gonna be able to do that. The next step they're gonna make you do is try to recover from your homeowner's carrier. Depending on what your homeowner's carrier has as an eligibility criteria, the underwriter might get a note that says, hey, they're doing Airbnb stuff now. So turning that in potentially to get the claims denial that you need in order to pursue a claim under the program with the hosting platform could inadvertently end up in an adverse underwriting decision happening against you and you were just trying to do what you needed to do to get your property repaired. So there can be some caveats to that. There are some companies out there that are starting to offer policies uh, for the person who uses multiple home sharing applications, much the same way a driver logs into multiple, multiple TNC apps. And there's also, uh, I believe there's a carrier out there that's now offering kind of an on-demand policy. It's Wednesday and you know you wanna go ahead and um, share your home on Friday night and it's gonna be for four nights, you can buy a policy that covers you for those four nights. So think of on-demand coverage, another example of uh, just where this whole economy is headed. So what are the takeaways for you, the agents and brokers? Know your client's underlying contract. If you're appointed with multiple companies or you write for multiple companies, this is a challenge, but know where the coverage exists, know where it's excluded and you know, talk to your client more than just at application time or more than just at renewal time. Uh, find out what they're doing, what they're thinking of doing. Have there been, are they in an area where this takes place a lot? Is, or, you know, if you're in a place where there's going to be a big event that year, where homes are gonna be, you know, people are wanting to rent out homes for that, that's the time to have that conversation and let them know if you do this, A, your company will not keep you if the company has uh, an eligibility issue with it, or if they do, you have to purchase this coverage or otherwise you're not covered. So 
there's gonna, there needs to be that constant exchange of information between you and your clients, as well as you and your insurers, to make sure that you understand either what they don't like, what they're trying to cover, and how much it's gonna cost. Same thing for TNC drivers, the exact same thing. I will tell you that uh, the rating impact is probably the murkiest of all of this because it's still also new. So to be able to definitively always say, you know, what's going to happen, maybe you can give them a, a, an idea now, but as those losses come in and that data comes in, those rates are going to change substantially if the coverage continues. And so it's um, paramount for you to stay on top of how the rating impact is also taking place as the exposure continues with your clients. So on the same concept of home sharing, I'll talk about new laws. We just closed our legislative session. We're switching. No more sharing economy for a minute. Uh, we have uh, this in California, for those of you that don't know, we have a two-year legislative session. So that means that bills can get introduced in the first year of the session. If they survive committee through that first year, then they can be carried over if there's no activity or they just for whatever reason stall out. This was our second year. We just closed out our second year. So if the bill didn't make it today, in this in 2017, it's essentially dead. Legislation never dies. So if these bills made it out, if they died in committee or they got vetoed by the governor, they'll be back. So I decided to try to just pick a couple that were of interest or of use to you. There's plenty more than this that came through uh, this year. But um, on this, to kind of connect to home sharing, Senate Bill 1092 did pass. And right now, the current law, before this one goes into effect, and these are January 1 effective dates, so just so you have that, uh, the home sharing platform, so the Airbnbs, if you will, they were required to disclose to their users that they needed to check their uh, rental contracts if they were tenants to make sure there wasn't any limitations on them doing this type of activity. And so part of this law added mobile home tenants to that. I know that seems odd, but there can be tenants that have mobile homes maybe in getaway destinations and then they're not there, so the idea of renting them out is, is possible. It also added a second provision to um, make sure that they disclose to their users that they check their policy. So not just the rental contract, but also their insurance policy to see where the coverages may be or may not be, or exclusions. So. Um, that is out there. It's just, it's an indication that the legislature acknowledges the fact that home sharing is out there and they're trying to deal with it. Uh, I think this is a step in the right direction because education is, is how you get to the later legislation that gets more specific. But right now, it's having a good handle on the user side. Am I even covered for this? So, or can I get coverage for it? So Senate Bill 1302, straightforward for whenever you have a client that's been declined by an insurance company for property insurance, the declination has to include information about the California Fair Plan and the potential that they may be able to secure coverage there. There is no requirement currently when an insured is canceled or non-renewed that they're told about the Fair Plan. A lot of your carriers include it right now on their notices, but as of January 1, those notices have to have the uh, information on the fair plan. So, and that is actually not going to be a requirement as part of the law until March 1st. Uh, carriers take a while to implement things, get things programmed on notices, so March 1st is when you'll see your termination notices have that information as well if they don't already. I will speak very briefly about Assembly Bill 2883. Your organization has done an excellent job of covering this. Is everybody familiar with this one? where the definition of a true director and officer has changed for work comp. It's a very, very narrow de definition. And I'm just bringing it up because the California Department of Insurance did put out a notice a couple weeks ago. So briefly, in case you're not familiar with this, uh, before directors and officers on work comp were generally not covered. You could opt in if you wanted, but they were generally not covered. Now there's a minimum percentage of stock ownership that those folks have to meet to be considered a director and an officer, or they have to have a certain type of ownership in the corporation or the LLC. If they do not meet that narrow definition, 
they have to be put onto the work comp policy and the only way to, and if they do meet those definitions and they don't want to be covered on the work comp policy, then there has to be a waiver signed. So this is a lot to deal with. Why is this such a big deal? As I said, the effective dates of these laws are January 1. Most of the time when legislation goes into effect on insurance policies, it'll say something along the lines of policies renewing, new, newer renewal policies on or after 1-1. The issue with this bill is that it's going to apply to all policies, even those in force, as of 1-1. So have a lot of you heard, for those of you who write work comp, have you heard from your insurer with the waiver? Have they told you how they're going to be handling this? Yes, no, hands? Some. The California Department of Insurance, as I mentioned, did issue a notification. They would like insurers to contact uh, agents by the 15th of this month to tell them a, here's the waiver that you're going to need to sign if you have folks that meet this narrow definition and they don't want to be added to comp. And oh, by the way, if they don't do either of those, now you have a whole new rating scheme. And there isn't necessarily any indication of how the insurers are going to deal with the additional premium that's potentially due as of January 1st on those existing policies. They may correct the rating and waive the premium. It's very difficult to do midterm premium adjustments because when they sold it back in, say, October, it was a different rate. So, um, but at the same time, the insurer, as of January 1, is held to specific premium tax requirements, reporting requirements, assessments, if appropriate. So uh, this is pretty, pretty disruptive for a lot of us. Very rarely do you see legislation go into effect that suddenly is, is applicable to everything that's in force. So just some challenges there that are going to come up at 2883. If you haven't heard from your work comp carriers, you should in the next week or two. 2591, AB 2591. This bill now allows insurers to electronically deliver termination notices. It does some other things too, but that's kind of the high point of it. There is a requirement in there that the person receiving it gives some type of acknowledgement of receipt. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's an email that comes back from the insured saying, thank you very much for my cancellation notice. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know if it's a, something that you can show in, in the server world. They opened the email. It's not all that well defined. Just a quick note about electronic delivery for those of you that may write in other states. Numerous states have passed legislation around the electronic delivery of things like termination notices. It's not generally the sole way for notices to be delivered. There are so many variances, for example, on what constitutes sent and received among each state, and none of them are consistent. Everybody has a little bit different criteria. So for a carrier, think about it, a lot of your carriers write in more than just California. How do they modify their system so that either there's some kind of ceiling where they can make it operate with the most prohibitive of rules, and then meeting all the other states. It's not like that. The rules are just all, it's scattershot. And so a lot of states, or excuse me, a lot of carriers are going, forget it. We're still going to do the old hard copy. They may provide it electronically as a service, but by no means are they utilizing electronic delivery as the sole method. So um, with uh, 2591, I think there's also a uh, one of the problems that you see with it, there's a sunset clause in there. So not only are your carriers not willing to modify their systems to get these notices uh, consistently delivered or some way or, or where they have a record to show, because in litigation, what is proof of mailing when you electronically deliver it? And there is no case law. There's no body of case law out there yet, really, to support what the courts are going to find as true proof of mailing. So carriers are a little bit skittish on utilizing this as the sole method of notification. And with a sunset clause, as there is in 2591, in the year 2021, that uncertainty about what's going to happen with the ability to do this electronically makes carriers equally as skittish. Why would I update my systems if the law could potentially go away in four years? So just it's, it's probably not something you're going to see carriers doing Solely, it would be a wonderful cost-saving benefit. Yes, we hear about how people want to do business electronically all the time, but think about it. If you miss a notification from any other kind of business outside of insurance, what are the, what's the impact if you miss it? It's not that big of a deal. If, if it's a bank notification, if it's a, another type of business that you're dealing with. But homes, 
I, I missed the cancellation notice on my homeowner's policy and then my home burns down. I missed the cancellation notice on my auto policy and I'm driving uninsured. The stakes are so much higher with termination notices and that's why you see so much grappling going on in the legislatures across the country. How do we make it so that we satisfy those folks who just want to do business electronically notification? So that's just my two cents on electronic delivery. This has kind of been a, I worked on the Senate Bill 251 uh, piece of legislation some years ago which allowed carriers to use electronic delivery for renewal offers because California didn't even let renewal offers go out electronically until that uh, legislation passed. So uh, near and dear to my heart. Quickly on regulations because we're going to get into autonomous vehicles which is the, the fun topic. How am I doing on time, gentlemen? I think I'm all right, here we go. We're off to the races. All right. I don't know what that means, but I think I have time. <laughs> okay. So I will tell you, the California Department of Motor Vehicles recently just uh, uh, put out another proposal for the second round of regulations for the what, what's called the post-testing deployment era of autonomous vehicles. What does that all mean? Well, so a couple of years ago, the Department of Motor Vehicles in California did put out and adopt round one of the regulations which set forth uh, requirements around the testing of autonomous vehicles and now they have been grappling with trying to put together round two which is the post testing and they are, um, they've been in draft for quite some time now and I think they will be still. They just held a workshop, I don't know if some of you are familiar, uh, recently in Sacramento about a couple weeks ago. Just some public comment on these particular Regulations, they are keeping the insurance requirements that are in place, I think $5 million liability required to be carried or some type of certification of that amount of coverage in place for the testers of these particular vehicles. And so what largely took place with the commentary, uh, people would get up, they would say kudos to the DMV for working on these regulations and, and really just being out there in front and then those comments would end with, but don't impede innovation, DMV. So it, it was, and almost every comment was, was framed like that. Thank you so much for working on this. We appreciate your attention to innovation, but don't stand in our way of innovating. So there's another workshop coming up, I think the beginning of next year, they have a legislative workshop that'll be coming in uh, for, for more commentary and testimony. So stay tuned. I don't think these regulations are going to be uh, offered as proposed anytime soon as they're still definitely in the draft stage. So what is happening with autonomous vehicles? I tell you, I, I was trying to get information for today and there was too much. And I, I got kind of excited because there was just so many uh, new developments happening just even in the last week or two. Not the least of which is a successful beer run with an autonomous truck. I don't know if anybody heard about that across Colorado. Yes. So anyway, we'll get to that in a minute though. So when I said that there was a rapidly changing landscape, I'm not kidding. It really is. And it's not just on the state level. It's also on the federal level. The U.S. Department of Transportation along with NHTSA, the National Highway and uh, Transportation Safety Administration, just released their highly automated, excuse me, their federal automated vehicle policy. They do not call them autonomous vehicles. They call them automated. It's an ambitious policy over 100 pages long. And it is a good example of the federal government being proactive with this innovative technology with, while still being mindful of uh, public safety. Again, the workshop held by the DMV, it was attended by NHTSA administrators and they did talk about that very uh, delicate dance. They are trying to be mindful of the technology. They know that people want to see this, but they also want it to be safe. So what does the federal policy contain? It's kind of a four chunk. Uh, thick uh, document. It is a living document, so it will be changed. It is open for public comment right now, so it won't necessarily change in the manner in which it was introduced a few weeks ago, but it is a living document and will be updated as the technology changes. So they, um, first of all, they've adopted the Society of Automotive Engineers uh, levels of automation. So level zero is just you driving your car with no intervention by a system at all. It's just no automation whatsoever. All the way up to level five, which is complete no human intervention whatsoever. And it gets a little murky down around level three because it's considered automated at that point, but they expect human intervention upon request. So 
I know there's a lot of young folks in the room, but for me, I immediately go to Hal, asking Dave, what are you doing, Dave? Because Hal read Dave's lips when they started to talk about the fact they were probably going to dismantle the computer because he was going a little bit rogue. And Hal didn't like that, so Hal took over. So kind of scary, but, and is that sci-fi? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. So back to the Fed policy, sorry. Four chunks, they are asking manufacturers to be mindful of about 15 criteria uh, for federal safety standards that can include things like data security, um, uh, safety of the vehicle in and of itself, uh, cyber protection for the uh, information that's uh, possessed on the vehicle, privacy. This is all things that are coming into play. We all know that the, the cars are talking to each other and then the cars are talking back to theoretically this infrastructure, whether it's run privately, government, a combination of the two. So they are not making mandates on the design of these vehicles. The feds are very clear about that, but they're suggesting that the companies self-certify and self-report saying in these 15 areas, here's what we've done to assure that we've met um, you know, the standard that are set forth in these uh, 15 criteria. So they have also put forth a model state policy because they still want to maintain that separation. The feds essentially would like to regulate the technology as well as the safety standards, leaving to the states what they already do today. So that can include vehicle licensing and registration, traffic laws, enforcement, um, the liability schema, do you have PIP, do you not, um, and then also the insurance requirements. So that model state policy is in there. And then finally, the last two chunks, they, they take a look to see, the feds take a look to see what regulatory tools do we have right now? What agencies do we have to provide oversight, regulatory oversight and agency oversight? What can work today with what we have? And then going forward, where do those tools need to be tweaked a little bit to compensate for the new technology? So again, a completely ambitious policy. At the end of the day, they will say safety is the number one concern. And how do you measure safety compared to what? Because humans and the way they operate their vehicles in unsafe manners largely goes unrecorded. We know there's accidents. We have those. We have that data. But how often we are maybe looking at our phone, maybe not texting, but looking at our phone. How often are we fiddling with the radio? All of those things that are happening and that never gets collected anywhere. So when the feds are looking to see how safe autonomous vehicles are, does that mean absolutely no crashes, no injuries whatsoever, ever? It's a, it's, it's a hard comparison to make because what are you comparing it to? So where are autonomous vehicles today? Well, I can tell you some of the latest developments. Like I said earlier, Uber is testing a fleet of autonomous vehicles, I believe, in Pittsburgh right now. So forget about the driver. Now Uber's just going to dispatch an autonomous vehicle to you. You sign up on their um, app and shows up this car and no driver, and you hop in and it takes you where you want to go. I just read just this morning, Uber's trying to set it up so that you can link it up with your calendar and your contacts so you can tell Uber, I want to go to... Rose's house, and so when the autonomous vehicle shows up, if Rose gives her permission, then it'll just take me to Rose's house, and I'll have to deal with addresses and all of those things. So Uber is just always changing, and it, it, it's so far away these days from what we remember and think of it as today, where there's someone showing up in their car to take you somewhere for a price. Uh, GM was set to test autonomous vehicles for Lyft. That was also supposed to be either happening or going to happen. Uber, for example, just bought a company called Auto. Have you heard of Auto? And they only bought it, I mean this when I say only, it was only $680 million. Such a steal. Auto is looking at autonomous technology for long haul trucks. Hence the beer run. Uh, that went, I think it went from one side of Colorado to about halfway through. It was, it was done in Colorado on the highways. And there is some speculation that the autonomous vehicle technology is going to actually be implemented quicker with long haul trucks because it's so much easier to have the technology focus on a highway as opposed to and roundabouts and parking lots. And so it's much easier to advance the technology if, if it's basically just going straight. By the way, on that beer run, the truck was autonomous except for getting on the on-ramp and the off-ramp. So anyway, 
I'm really excited about the beer run. I don't know why. I thought it was pretty cool. So anyway, um, so what we, when we think of autonomous vehicles, you know, what do we think of? Well, we hope that there's less crashes. We hope that traffic patterns improve because the autonomous vehicle would anticipate the heavy traffic in front and decide to take a different route. Um, and it maybe reduce costs in health care, maybe reduce costs in insurance. That's all possible, absolutely. But when we think about what, what is so paramount with this because it is relinquishing human control and none of us, none of us are good at that. We like to drive our own car. We're okay maybe getting on a public bus because we can still see the guy driving and that's okay. We're a little less comfortable getting on an airplane because we really don't have any control, but there's a human in the cockpit, so okay. Now you're giving up that control to a computer, essentially. So that public perception of safety is the first threshold, it's the highest threshold, and that's what people are struggling with today. How many of you have heard about the accident involving the Tesla vehicle? So for those of you who haven't, there was a gentleman operating his Tesla on an autopilot feature, and the Tesla went underneath the trailer, and the person in the Tesla did lose his life. And so very shocking, very horrifying, very tragic, that's the thing that sticks in your mind, not the numerous amounts of times that autonomous vehicles have operated without incident. But that's that public perception of safety that people have. It's a hurdle, and it's a big one, because we remember the Tesla accident. We don't remember all the times that it successfully drove from point A to point B without any kind of occurrence. So assuming your public confidence gets to that high point, what could we see? Well, I think you'll see the TNC concept morphing into what Uber is testing today, uh, they would just have a fleet of autonomous vehicles. So, uh, and if there's large enough availability, then vehicle ownership may take a huge dive because it's gonna be more of a transactional uh, situation. I need to go to the store, let me call up an AV and get me over there. I don't need to have a car sitting in my driveway 85% of the time. So, there are people out there that have put timelines on this stuff. I would never do that. But there are people that say, oh, well, in one year, I think we'll see this. And in three years, we'll see this. And in 10 years, it's going to be this. And I, I'm not that confident because I don't have that crystal ball that apparently they do. But, uh, and, and the things that I, that I didn't expect to happen have happened. And some of the things that I did think would happen by now haven't. So no timelines, but just ideas to think about going down the road. Uh, what are the insurance implications? Oh, good grief. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we talked about maybe lower health care costs, maybe lower insurance costs because you don't have uh, drivers having this many losses. Well, let me tell you, those losses are still going to be disputed. It's going to be a question of who screwed up? Did the computer screw up? Was it the hardware? Was it the software? Was it the manufacturer? Was it all three? Was it theirs or yours? Was it the infrastructure? Who's operating the infrastructure where they talk to the mothership, so to speak? You will have litigation costs that will reflect the advanced expertise needed by everyone involved, expert witnesses, computer folks. So what I predict is that as though you may see your insurance costs reduce because you won't see as many accidents and injuries, you will see your insurance costs correspondingly increase because things like repairing these vehicles is going to be so much more expensive than it is today. Do your carriers have the claims expertise to as adjust these types of claims on these vehicles. Do they even know what these systems are capable? These are very sophisticated systems. Think about the Google car, for example, the uh, pod car. Am I looking at five minutes? I don't see anybody back there, so we'll just keep going. Uh, uh, so uh, the Google pod car, what does it have? It's got LIDAR on it. It's got laser detection of, of a car in front of it to measure that uh, distance, you know, Radar, there's redundancy technology because if one system fails on the autonomous vehicle, the other systems are supposed to pick up the slack. Um, the, when you see the Google car, right, you see that 360 sensor spinning on the top. That's better than any of us can get. When we go like this, and when we go like this, it's about 220 degrees, maybe 240 degrees. There's a whole section back there we don't see. We have backup cameras. Some of them are better than others, and do we always look at them? Just because you have it doesn't mean we're actually looking at it when you're backing up. So it's just, it, there, I think what we have to take away from this is that as the technology advances, it's extremely expensive to introduce and extremely expensive to repair. 
So how do you cover that? Will there have to be new um, products offered by, you know, new endorsements for this type of computer technology? Uh, those are all going to be things that your carriers are going to be thinking about as this uh, comes along. Liability, again, your basic theories of legal liability are not going to change. Uh, and, but the discussion for a long time with autonomous vehicles is who's liable? Is it the human who failed to intervene? Is it the hardware system that didn't operate properly? Is it the software that was outdated? Or maybe the driver just didn't update it because he didn't want to deal with it at that particular time? Or was it bad software and it was uh, set up with bad data? Or is it a combination of all three? So there has been a suggestion, this is not mine, I absolutely take no credit for this, but there is the idea that potentially at some point insurance can shift from a third party protection type product to first party. You know, I have this autonomous vehicle, I'm going to buy what I want, what I need. If I don't think I need to cover this vehicle, if it's wrecked, then I don't buy any coverage for it. Still having the, the tort theories of liability, still having subrogation out there, but theoretically there's no more human necessarily to go after. It's just going to be, my car was hit because their hardware was bad, I'm going to go after that company. So for those of us having individual AV ownership, autonomous vehicle ownership, maybe it shifts to a first party type coverage. And oh my gosh, would that turn on its head? What would the rating structure look like for that? So not my idea, but just thoughts of things that could change. Other developments, you have uh, websites starting to pop up with ways to modify your existing vehicle so that they're more autonomous. Scary, John in his garage, I don't know, putting in some type of lane detection, you know, thing on his car so that it beeps or goes off. There are websites out there literally giving uh, suggestions on how to modify your vehicle. How's traffic enforcement going to deal with that? How are your insurance companies going to deal with that? Because a lot of your modification uh, underwriting guidelines on modifying vehicles is really geared more towards racing, uh, those types of things, not for nowhere near entertaining this particular uh, possibility. So uh, how will insurance companies underwrite? I don't know. You know, personal lines underwriting right now is in a state of kind of becoming uh, tough to um, see beyond, at least for auto, beyond that clue report and that MVR. So now you've got a whole new way to underwrite. You've got computer companies to look at. You've got AV manufacturing companies to look at. It's going to be not necessarily loss history and driving record, but more of this company performance that they'll be looking at. And then again, and I don't want to focus on this because you've heard so much about it, I'm sure, but the data analytics. You've got so much data at, at the hands of the manufacturers, the users. Where does it all go? How do you protect it so that it doesn't get hacked? And then the data that you're getting, how is it getting used? So for those of you that are really into analytics, that's a whole other discussion, a whole other CE unit could be spent just on data analytics and the, and the proper use of the data that's coming in and the protection of the data uh, from the parties that it's coming from. So lastly, what's your agent broker takeaway for autonomous vehicles? They're coming. I don't know when and I don't know how, but they're coming. That's all I can tell you. That's my crystal ball. Stay up on the regulatory developments because they will drive what the insurance requirements will be. So pay attention to that DMV workshop information. Those regulations are coming. And it might be a surplus lines over to admitted trend, but TNC coverage didn't end up taking that route. It started off in the admitted market. So it may not. It just depends. Insurers have to come up with rating structures and claim staff that have the expertise. Underwriters have to figure out what it is that they're willing to take on from an eligibility uh, standpoint. And you will have to learn those new coverages and product offerings that your carriers are uh, providing, assuming they do. Uh, and lastly, but not leastly, I'm going to just uh, put lawyers on the spot. Your product liability lawyers and your expert witnesses are ready to go, and they will be in high demand, and they will be very expensive. So stay tuned on that. I, this went by really fast. I hope you had some gems in there to take away uh, for both the sharing economy and autonomous vehicles as well as the new laws. Thanks for having me, and uh, have a great rest of your conference.